Well, thanks to you all for for battling through the sunshine to to get here. Um, it's a real pleasure to to introduce. I'll, I'll actually introduce Nikolaus Hirsch, who is one of the editors of uh, of Keller Easterling's book, uh, together with Marcus Meissen, and um, and I'll just hand it over to Keller. Thanks for coming. First to me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Brian, and uh, thank you. Yeah, to you, Brian, Anton, Magda, and everybody from EFLEX uh, to host us tonight because it's a yeah, really great moment to release the book by Keller Easterling, Subtraction. And we are going to hear a presentation, although Keller thought we will just, just start with drinks here, but maybe we should also hear a bit about uh, what the book is about. And uh, we'll have a short discussion um, between Keller, Brian, and me, and then, of course, open to the floor. And uh, maybe just a few words about the, uh, this publication series, which we called uh, Critical Spatial Practice. Um, a slightly ambitious title, of course. Um, therefore, in the first edition, we started, or the title of the first edition of that book series was What is Critical Spatial Practice? We invited a number of uh, authors, scholars, practitioners to uh, give an answer to that question, and some of those people are actually here also tonight, which is a uh, great pleasure. And um, since then we made uh, four editions, or Keller's is the fourth, the fourth book in this series. Uh, the first one was, as I said, um, what is critical spatial practice, uh, around 60 contributions. Um, every book is... Um, Combined with a with a small uh, contribution by a photographer, artist, or graphic designer. In the first case, it was Amin Linke documenting the uh, Occupy camp in front of the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. In the second book, uh, which is a conversation between Markus Miesen and Chantal Mouffe, uh, called "The Space of Agonism." Um, we had a contribution by, by Rabia Mure, um, a piece about the, the war in Syria, um, very close to his uh, work at Documenta, that he presented at Documenta. The third book um, actually launched um, at Eva Franch's place, who just entered the space uh, here at a Storefront. It was, uh, it's a book... Um, written by Beatrice Colomina called Manifesto Architecture, The Ghost of Mies. Um, that book was um, somehow um, yeah, elaborated together with Dan Graham. Um, we went to Dan Graham's archive and yeah, found some images, early images, about that dealt with the, one of the topics of that book, transparency, uh, slides from the 70s of Dan Graham's archive. And now, um, as I said, we have Keller Easterling's book, uh, Subtraction, um, which was developed together with Metahaven, which was um, Keller's idea also, which there's, of course, the, the link uh, with Metahaven through... Yeah, collaborative teaching, partly at Yale University. And uh, so it's a very different book in its characters. It's much more graphic and uh, much more direct in a way. And um, yeah, I think the rest I'm going to leave to Keller. And it's a great pleasure to have you here and to talk about the book and um, to learn what you think subtraction is. Thank you. Should we have the slides? Yeah. Uh, okay, great. 
So, yeah, I did think that I was inviting you for a drink and milling around, so I'm sorry that you have to sort of hear me hold forth for a little while, but um, I'm doing as I'm told. Um, uh, but when Nicholas asked me to, to think about a book for their critical practice series, I decided that I, I, to write about a number of projects that I'd been working on actually since 1995 when I first taught a seminar at Columbia titled Economies of Subtraction. And it just began with the premise that the subtraction of buildings was maybe as important as the making of buildings. And it asked a kind of simple question. Um, whatever the pleasures and prodigious efforts that are associated with erecting architecture, whatever the violence of its removal, was there an art of causing it to disappear that could be equally compelling and constructive? Every building is also a subtraction. We know that the ecologies of building subtraction are often indifferent and violent, often only a little slower than warfare. Marketers and financial experts and planners and politicians can detonate buildings and landscapes. And the tabula rasa is a favorite weapon of the trigger-happy architect who longs to replace the world with their superior designs and the urban magistrate with their masquerades of cleansing and purifying diseased fabric often disenfranchise entire populations, clearing slums, deciding who will live and die. This is commercial and bureaucratic shock and awe. That's what Marshall Berman called herbicide, and he used the word to describe effects that can be similar, whether they're in Lagos or the South Bronx or in war in Sarajevo. But we also know that buildings themselves destroy other buildings, not only because they, they replace the previous structure, but because, or because they encourage migrations into and away from cities, but also because they can, just by their very toxic presence, cause surrounding buildings to tumble to the ground. And most buildings today are also designed as repeatable spatial products with rapid cycles of obsolescence so that the, the tiniest new wrinkle in market theory can render them unusable. And whether they're a recently constructed casino or a house or a massive sports stadium, financial industries surround this seemingly static and durable building with a volatile balloon of inflating and deflating value. And in the wake of recent crisis, catastrophes and population shifts as buildings are turning over and, and radiating negative value, building subtraction is an emergent heavy industry. And con while constructing tall buildings or dams or highways uh, and other large public works that involve um, you know, dynamite and large scale movements of men and uh, materials have traditionally provided sort of building spectacle, but now it's the deletion of buildings that provides this theater. Ruined and, and decay has its own pornography. Demolition has its own TV shows. Disassembly and teardown are now popular art forms. And the newest approaches to building and removal even appear to kind of retract skyscrapers into the ground. They, they drop them down on jacks. And, and, um, so, but so finally, it's, anyway, it's easy to see, finally, uh, with half-closed eyes, an accelerated time lapse in which large swaths of building and landscape seem to be simultaneously um, cultivated and harvested, built and unbuilt. <laughs> Uh, where you can see an economy where, where subtraction is the other half of building. And of course, this subtraction economy already exists, has long existed, and it, it's still perceived as something that doesn't exist, as something negative and therefore kind of unknowable or to be avoided, even when subtraction is planned, is often treated as the disposal of, of an accident or an unintended consequence, a failure of planning's uh, laughable utopias. It's, it's seen as erasure rather than exchange, loss rather than growth. Um, and when, when building is the only kind of proper sanctioned event, um, there's no platform in place for handling the deletions that reasonably or unreasonably always accompany building. So, so might we make that subtraction and all the different species of subtraction more palpable? 
Architects and urbanists are connoisseurs of object form, expressed with shape, outline, geometry. And the design of object form usually results in the addition of building. But, but what if subtraction is one of those events that tutors nothing less than an additional approach to form making? And what if subtraction also models nothing less than a parallel economy? So those are the issues um, that are being discussed in this very slim volume. Um, and I have to say that it, it was fun to work on because it was a little precipitant of a larger project, maybe a prequel to a much longer work. It's a book I'm working on titled Extra State Craft. It's coming out in the fall from Verso. And something about this material didn't quite fit or somehow stood between different projects. Um, but maybe it provides another example of form making or activism or parallel economies that are discussed in that larger work. And anyway, it was fun for that reason, because it uh, was a tiny little precipitant. But subtraction has been crucial to the last 40 years of architectural history. Some building projects like Tower and the Park Housing Projects generated multiple waves of subtraction, first clearing land to be built, um, then radiating negative value, then being demolished themselves. Since the 1960s, highway also have generated multiple waves of subtraction, clearing land to be built, sort of 40 acres per mile, and then continuing to broadcast a field of subtraction around 100 yards or so from their edge. Sometimes those waves of subtraction from highways and houses were exacerbated by other forces in Rust Belt cities. Um, in 1993, um, in a project called Erasing Detroit, an architect, Dan Hoffman, who's really sort of pioneer in thinking about this idea of building subtraction, was among the first to say, quote, uh, unbuilding has surpassed building as the city's major architectural activity. And then, you know, a decade later, we saw the Shrinking Cities exhibition, um, it, you know, that, that looked at sort of countless cities around the world uh, that were like Detroit, that has spent as much time shrinking as they have growing. St. Louis, a shrinking city, um, uh, where the dem there was a demolition of pruitt Igo, was a sort of rhetorical favorite in the generational violence of architects, where Pru pruitt Igo was a sort of juju of modernism that had to be killed so postmodernism could live, so that the postmodern architect could once again wear the toupee of the avant-garde. Um, but one of the buildings in that, in that set was the subject of a, of, a, of a, not a demolition, but an implosion experiment, where they tried dynamite, putting dynamite in the lower floors and then letting the building drop on, onto itself, which is now, of course, the way that most buildings die. And it's telling that that technique only works on buildings that are structurally sound, uh, structurally coherent, maybe even young. Uh, buildings that are over five stories tall, like that sky dome that I showed you earlier. And the experiment spawned a global company, um, Control Demolition Incorporated, that's now a global deconstruction company. And one chapter in Enduring Innocence, I tried to follow the work of that company as a kind of index of what in the world was being deleted from housing towers to Cold War military installations to all the rapidly obsolescent spatial products, most famously the, the Las Vegas casinos that were imploded in New Year's Eve celebrations. This is a picture of the dunes that, that was collapsed as a result of um, a cannon fire from the staged frigate uh, battle at the Treasure Island Hotel across the street. Um, and there were lots of those. But maybe nothing more spectacular than the failures of a supposed economic science. And the, the reason for sort of picking up this subtraction problem again in 2008, when the evening news in the United States was, was training their cameras on the single family house as a kind of mascot of the, the financial crisis um, and the bundled mortgages and the quants and uh, so on, who had turned this relatively banal object into a global contagion of financial disaster. Locally, the invisible force field of failure was creating these, the empty big boxes, the abandoned suburbs, you all know. But in, globally, the buckshot was equally powerful if harder to trace. And, 
ever since uh, 34, when the FHA used a single family house as a flagship industry for addressing banking and jobs and housing, the same poor little bankrupt uh, structure has been used as an economic and jobs indicator. Um, so the same evening news bemoans the fact that more are not being built. And so as it simultaneously exacerbates and relieves the financial crisis, everyone's staring at the house, demanding that it behave like money again. This is the sound economic science. And yet, it, in, you know, this, in this most massive uh, banking failure, maybe it was so spectacular that it performed a kind of magic. Um, maybe it, it, you know, it may have transformed buildings and landscapes back into buildings and landscapes, rather than trafficked mortgage products, uh, products. You know, when mold grows in the pool, when copper pipes fetch money on the market, when the house is kind of back sitting in a gravitational field, when the taxes are due, banks are happier to somehow settle with the municipality. And land banks have been one organ um, for resettling, resetting the house, allowing it to, by going underwater, duck out from under a financial abstraction to become physical, durable object again, to be resold or re-aggregated for use by citizens and cities. This is just a picture of Cleveland where I was last week looking at this, this phenomenon. And there's a kind of spirit of the teardown, you know, the teardowns that are sort of now you either performed live or um, on YouTube or an iMac or a hard drive or Roomba or Kimball or something or methodically reduced to an inventory of pieces. Um, actually, in, in 88, Dan Hoffman's 9119 um, St. Cyril was a prescient teardown. But anyway, it's a spirit of teardown. Where these properties are being treated with new schemes that make them palpable physical counterpart to the financial software, that, that we're making a kind of a alternative physical portfolio, just as the financial industry is allowed to have all kinds of hedges and futures against risk. And it's not just the sort of 74 million tons of debris now seen as material streams for recycling and reuse that are part of this alternative portfolio. It's really the possibility of trading and negotiating, revaluing vacancy an alternative portfolio of value that's more tangible, uh, uh, has more tangible rewards and safeguards against risk. This is Youngstown. The thought it could do something like this, kind of creative shrinkage. Um, and on a global scale, just as, we, just as we trust the financial industry, we seem to trust that the carbon market, the NGOcracy, organizations like ISO should be able to lead with econometrics and informatics and standards and bureaucratic management. In sensitive landscapes, this happens to be the Ecuadorian Amazon, is also several ways of traction that come from things like road. First, the road is cut, and then even the smallest roads can radiate you know, fields of subtraction. And again, while we've put a lot of faith in the carbon market and protocols like RED, now there is in this rain, in the, among the rainforest nations, attempts to trade in alternative markets, other values besides carbon, uh, re related to biodiversity, indigenous cultures, undiscovered chemical substances, and so on. So anyway, it's clear that subtraction prompts a parallel economy. In all these cases, we also want to say that somehow, um, in addition to abstract economic variables, more tangible, tangible spatial variables might lead. Um, it's clear also that a subtraction protocol might be appropriate in many parts of the world where there's a distended overdevelopment, um, like here in the ghost suburbs of Las Vegas, or where development confronts environmental issues like the rainforest, or where development would be wise to retreat from exhausted land or floodplains. Um, you know, I would like to argue that architects who, who know something about how to make the building machine lurch forward might also know something about how to put it in reverse. Um, the methods for demolishing, imploding, or otherwise subtracting building are not among the essential skills that we learn in architectural training. So, so what do we have? Um, how, how, how does subtraction of tutor an additional approach to form making? The historian and critic Thomas Van Loewen um, uh, projected a moment when 
Pritzkers would be given to architects for their removal of building. But then after announcing this idea, he, qu he quickly listed all of the, the in, kind of in the more conservative tabula rasa uh, uh, tradition, listed all the tasteless buildings that he would remove. And maybe Cool House's La Défense uh, project, a project to remove successive waves of development, beginning with the most recent, uh, is a prime candidate for this Pritzker. Gunter Rambo's collaged explosions of 1976, updated for 2008 financial crisis, are similar rhetorical counter-aggressions. Arata Isozaki's City Demolition Industry, Inc., which is a 1962 story of killing by demolition a city that was a murderer. Um, and Isozaki sort of very slyly splits himself into two characters, one who demolishes and the other who offers utopian solutions for the city, um, you know, both kind of murderers mirroring each other. And there are echoes of Isozaki in, in Earth Liberation Front, a contemporary self-appointed uh, pirates of subtraction who murder to avenge the murder of development. Um, and now, so now not only the slums or the disenfranchised or the adversaries of war are sitting behind the bulldozer, uh, it's the perfectly sound, the most privileged, the most legally protected populations that are targets for their destruction. So with elf ecosage, if there's forests or, that are logged, if there's animals that are threatened, or any other aspects of nature that are destroyed, elf matches fire with fire, um, uh, matches the destructive powers of development itself. Uh, by inflicting damage on suburbia, burning and, and defacing suburban McMansions. If you build it, we will burn it. The counter-aggressions of an architects like Robert Smithson or Gordon Mata Clark, perhaps also very close to the architecture they critique in some funny way. Um, but when Cedric Price says, and, and I'm sorry for the people who aren't architects in the room, this may be a little coded. Um, but when Cedric Price says anti-building is, is, re is really non-building, just as anti-plan was non-plan, here there's something different, something slightly different. Maybe a bit of bombast about not saving preserved buildings, maybe a bit of tabula rasa, but, but it, it's an expression of the art of not building. Is this different? Um, but beyond the tabula rasa, beyond the contour of excisions, uh, sculptural excisions, or beyond the object form that usually results in an addition of building. Um, but I, I want to go even further, and there's a bit of speculation about this in the book and more in the extra statecraft, to think about active forms that work something more like software, like a spatial software with spatial variables to counter the financial softwares. A software in which both buildings and vacancies become currencies in an exchange or an interdependence. So this form in another gear or another register is what I'm sort of hoping opens onto an enhanced artistic repertoire, maybe a redoubled territory of endeavor. I always show this image. I'm sorry if you've seen me say this, but um, I always show this image of 18th century Savannah as a simple example of a kind of spatial software because it was a city that didn't have a plan uh, or an outline. It just had a growth protocol that called for several counterbalancing quotients of public, private, green space that would be contained in a ward, and then that ward would be the unit of growth, and then for every ward, there would be agricultural space outside the city. So the protocol wasn't an object form. It was an active form, like a software. Um, uh, so I'm wondering, is there a subtraction protocol or playbook like Savannah, but in reverse? Is there a physical counterpart to the financial software where active forms, like bits of code in that software, can act like spatial levers or ratchets or offsets? to stabilize, compete with, maybe even overwhelm financial markets. So a kind of interplay between spatial variables that, that gradually direct both building and unbuilding. Um, and maybe there's another kind of artistic satisfaction, another aesthetic repertoire here related to population and network effects. Um, and it's in addition to, and most definitely in support of, uh, an aesthetic repertoire of active form, not, not opposed to it. So one of the subtraction projects, and I'm sort of finishing with this, but one of the subtraction projects I worked on was an imagined 
um, subtraction software or a playbook as a kind of game that also turned the, like Elf turned the tables on the usual victims of subtraction, the disenfranchised, by imagining a game of subtracting McMansions. And it was kind of like a reverse game of Go where, that favored clearings instead of walls. You know the, the war game of Go where you make walls and fortresses, but this is re reversing that where the object is thinking about how you make clearings. So simply put, it made property linkages between densifying and de-densifying or failed properties. So revenues from one type of densifying move would be used uh, to support or relieve a failed property. And then a clearing had to be of sufficient quality to render valuable a spot on its perimeter. But the scramble is then to be in contact with the perimeter in a way that doesn't kill the clearing, if you follow. And different species of property whose tax revenues have been linked then have a stake in each other's enterprises. Cities can acquire uh, and aggregate properties for other kinds of infrastructures or other kinds of projects. And when either density or those enterprises are successful, they generate sort of micro dividends for both properties. Um, maybe the details of this are less important than the idea that um, subtraction is not so much removal, um, but a kind of exchange, kind of reabsorption of building, about an interplay between inaugurating and relieving, replacing, recasting building. Uh, space made through clearing is one pleasure, but it's different from a tabula rasa. Never wholly negative, only kind of translated from one use to another. And as with any game, it's easy to imagine some kind of dangerous, unintended consequences and flipper quants with their own TV shows. But it could be a productive exercise um, um, to think about interdependent building portfolios um, and may even be a kind of rehearsal for some somewhat less violent tools of acquisition, some more safeguards against disenfranchisement in the margins of informal settlement. So at the moment, there are a few spatial variables used in the protocols of global governance to address environment or global development or labor. And th this is obviously a slide of the Rana Plaza that lets me say there are other, ki there are other kinds of subtraction discussed in the book. And in this image of all the debris being cleared away from Rana Plaza lets me say that in all the cases of, of subtraction, the desire for innocence or the reductive dreams of utopia masquerading, masquerading as betterment are often the first subtraction. The gentle tone, however the gentle, the tone of the rhetoric, the desire to remain innocent or reduce or eliminate anything that contradicts or threatens the prevailing power is fundamental to the most violent, least productive forms of subtraction. So instead, might subtraction be a deliberate tool for managing building exchanges, one that ironically makes settlement even sturdier in the face of violence? Years ago, there were no um, professional preservationists and no techniques of pre preservation taught in universities. Soon there might be training not only in building and preserving, but also managing the subtraction and the contraction of development a practice that even arguably has a tradition in the discipline. So, but anyway, if the least productive subtraction is the disposal of failure and error or the eradication of contradictions to power and taste, maybe the most productive subtractions do, do not erase information but release a flood of information and association. And maybe only in these instances, uh, subtraction can be growth. Thank you, those are my remarks. Very brief. Thank you, Keller. Yes. This was, I think, uh, really great to, uh, to have this insight and, and kind of contextualization of, of, of the book. Um, just to maybe kick off uh, the discussion, um, I was wondering, um, since you presented uh, subtraction as a practice um, somehow beyond a purely negative practice or absent practice, 
um, as something, as a kind of productive force. And uh, you also mentioned the term um, productive uh, destruction, um, which relates to to a term invented by Schumpeter in, in, it's in this kind of uh, economic theory. So um, is this, to what extent is this notion of a, of a productive force in, in, in um, a subtraction related to Schumpeter in a clear way or in a, in a, in a direct way? And uh, of course, in that sense, to the whole history and and also the practice of capitalism as a mode of very often dysfunctional, but in a weird way also very functional mode of exchange through destruction. Right. Oh, well, thank you for that easy question. Just to. Um, uh, um, well, yeah, well, obviously referring, I mean, I, I'm not referring directly to Schumpeter, but there's a, but there's a, the, the whole idea of a kind of creative destruction is, is in that tradition. Um, um, and, it, and I think in some ways the, the crash is just a lucky moment where it's, where it's so intense that one, that one is able to see um, 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 a whole other set of, of economies operating um, uh, that um, uh, well as I, as I as I tried to explain um, one can see um, um, the possibility of another kind of interplay first of all it's not it's not just a, a, a great sort of uh, uh, Boogeyman of a of a particular kind of capital that's work at work. There are all kinds of different markets, and one recognizes that if one makes a single sort of uh, uh, enemy of of an abstract idea of capital, that's nowhere near vigilant enough to understand what's really going on and to see uh, all the different forces at play um, and to see the kind of sneakiness of the market as well. So there's been something really productive in that. In the in the in the failure, um, uh, but then also uh, you know a way of of looking at some of the more violent ecologies and thinking of ways in which they might not be as violent um, um, and learning learning to make them less violent through subtraction itself. This was, this was one of the most interesting parts of the book for, for me, was the way that you use subtraction as a kind of a fail-safe for the violence of, of utopian progress, right? As something that can, that, can explain, that can explain the violence before it becomes something that can account for a kind of steamroller of, of, of a progress that, that refuses to acknowledge that anything will ever be taken down, right? And you you speak about actually the uh, about finance in the same way when you when you speak about houses it's almost as if as if somehow you know some kind of a uh, like a a positivist future got bloated or got uh, got overpopulated and had to and somehow the bubble burst and you have you end up with this kind of contradictory contradictory figure of, of, of the house, this, is, this I thought was really interesting, where the house is both a financial instrument or, or something that value is pegged to, but then also a concrete object where people, where people live. Right, right. And that is, that is finally what happens, that you know, when they're sitting there long enough and they, you know, they become objects again, um, then all kinds of problems happen. Um, banks don't know what to do. Cities that were angry with banks um, don't know what to do. And then they, bo both parties are now kind of finally overcoming their suspicions of each other to, to sit down and, and kind of cleanse a lot of those properties. Uh, and it's so interesting to see how they're doing it. Uh, it, mean, it means they have to do a kind of funny surgery on the on the books. Um, they have to take certain. I was just when I was in Cleveland, this uh, man that I was speaking to, he had to figure out a way to make his entire organization exist by taking the amount of money that they usually get from delinquent taxes 
uh, and then take that amount and, and use it to fund his organization. And it, it's, I mean, he, he, he described himself to me as a Ronald Reagan Republican, um, but he was doing the most amazingly creative things with, um, with, uh, with the financial underpinnings. He was hacking the, the financial system of the, of the city. Um, I was also wondering about the, maybe you can explain a little bit the, the term subtraction in difference to um, demolition and destruction, because it seems to me that this, it, you are using that, in a very, that term, subtraction, in a very particular way. Um, yeah. Um, well, I'd, I used it in this book because, because it had been the book, that had been the word that I just had been using for all, all these different views of taking architecture away. Um, 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 I mean, I, I honestly, it could have been another word. Um, I mean, it could have been deletion, uh, but, but, I, uh, but, um, but, I, but I wanted it to be a little more neutral than um, um, you know, destruction or something like that. It's something that could be, that could suggest both adding and subtracting that there were that there were other maybe sides of a e maybe it also hints to the term you used um, building in reverse so that actually it goes it's kind of multi-directional right 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 yeah I mean there are other as, as I said in the book there are other discussions about about more violent forms of subtraction and warfare and um, uh, and like Rana Plaza which is just kind of the drip, drip, drip of, uh, of violence that finally drops something to the ground. Um, um, but, I, but I wanted to choose a word that would be a little bit more neutrally placed but between, the, between the truly violent and, and grisly forms of subtraction in the world and, and, and something that we might learn from them. I think maybe we can we can open the floor up to questions also. Thank thank you, Kalerud. This was that was great. Um, I would, if we try to um, think of subtraction in relationship to building. And if we assume that building is, is the construction of value, and therefore if subtraction is a way of building, is a construction of value, um, there was a moment in which the use of terms and the possibility of, and the interchangeability of the terms in relationship to building became confusing to me in the moment that non-building appeared in the uh, possible equations of what is that that we are talking about when we talk about subtraction. Because there is a moment in which if subtraction is still a way of building or building in reverse, um, the non-building is a moment of um, almost of pause, of, um, of absence, of um, non-existing. And I like to see how your images are also these gifts where there is a kind of relentlessness of this process, where that absence is rendered as a moment that doesn't go in towards the construction of a value. So I would like you to articulate a bit more the non-building part of subtraction versus the building part of subtraction. Yeah, well, I went very breathlessly over that little set of diagrams of that the, the sort of reverse game of Go or... Uh, um, or um, yeah, a game of go that favored clearings instead of instead of walls, um, uh, just because I was worried that the details would bore you. But but um, but the but the um, what what I'm trying to suggest there is that there there is probably for every city another kind of little software. Another set of interdependencies, another kind of playbook of uh, or interplay of spatial variables that could be written in the same way that that, that guy I was talking about, you know, was hacking hacking the kind of municipal budget, um, uh, and 
so in that, in the, in the the one that I was describing here, it's just a very general kind of game of go in reverse. Um, but for Cleveland, different from Las Vegas, different from uh, um, another mega city, there would be a different set of interplays, a different kind of software that you would have to write. But in that one, it was just simply uh, talking about a kind of um, uh, speculating that there, w that there would be a densifying revenues um, that would help to relieve um, sites that were underwater um, and, and really were having trouble existing. And that then when, when those sites were relieved um, or cleared, um, that the enterprises that, that could exist on those sites, and that you know, every city is experimenting with this. There's another in California that's taking, taking uh, houses back by eminent domain and then giving them right back to their owners and you know, doing all kinds of things like this. But the, the idea with this was that then the two different sites that are in interplay uh, benefit, from, benefit from each other, um, almost with kind of, almost like shares in a co-op or, or give to each other kind of micro dividends. So there's no site that can be wiped away. Um, and it's that part of it, that even though it's a game with McMansions, that makes one think possibly that, uh, you know, in the, the, um, the conundrum that um, Hernando de Soto and David Harvey had about, you know, what, what do you do with, a, um, with areas of informal settlement? I'm sorry, I'm going on too long, but, but what do you do with areas of informal settlement and the problem being of you can't give a deed to this person with informal settlement because it'll be just that, it'll be just that e much easier for them to be bought out. Um, in any case, this is an attempt with this reverse game of Go to demonstrate something where you can never be wiped out, um, where you found a kind of interplay and an interdependency. Um, so I'm fantasizing that as, arch that as architects, we're, we would be good at this. We would be good at, uh, you know, better than people who work for ISO or better than um, uh, financial consultants and management consultants. We would be good at identifying what constitutes a reasonable interplay of spatial variables. David, when, when um, <coughs> during the last um, mortgage crisis, the the you know the David made this point that this demonstrated to him what every crisis and fluctuation in the building market has uh, demonstrated that it's not the buildings that are valuable anyway; it's the uh, ground rent, and so it's irrelevant what's on the on the site, and it's absolutely necessary for the fluctuate for the development of uh, capitalist uh, forces it, it, the, for the fluctuation in the ground rent. That just like the South Bronx was absolutely, uh, a, you know, a, a, a kind of predictable process of um, l devaluing the land so that the land can then become revalued. But the, the buildings are irrelevant. So I, I'm a little bit questioning whether or not. The, the cycle of destruction or, you know, deletion and uh, construction is, is, is at all relevant to the cycle of capitalism itself. Well, w w this is talking about the land, right. uh, not necessarily the buildings. Um, this is about land banking and about, uh, I mean, it's true, the buildings kind of come and go, but the, the the properties is, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Um, uh, I don't know if that's clear, but. Uh. So if um, subtraction is to become a design activity, which it seems like the basis, of, or the, the basic promotion here that designers can celebrate subtraction, if the if the market is kind of already doing its thing, the technology is there. Clearly, we've seen it. We know we can gracefully uh, remove the buildings. The regulatory structures may or may not be helping us out. The cultural 
value associated with the buildings? Is that something that, you know, we, there's so much investment symbolically in what a building is, and is it within the purvey of the designer to actually be investing the same kind of um, symbolic energy into this, the subtraction, like the, the projects of uh, the Editing Detroit project or Gordon Matta Clark's where, you know, there's this, the beauty in that. Um, is that essentially what you're promoting? Well, I guess I'm saying that what's so interesting when one looks at these failed uh, properties in uh, the Rust Belt is that they are, they are now being revalued in a whole lot of different ways for, uh, with many different kinds of uh, values. Uh, yes, cultural values and other values and um, values that had to do with their position in the city. The same, the same with the kind of rainforest situation where you know, when, when there's concern that that the really complicated and, and way too technical carbon market that's supposed to be saving these uh, properties is is just imp impossible to deal with. There's many people who who are saying well, we don't we want we want a market that's a market of biodiversity or a market of in, in, indigenous uh, culture um, and even in Ecuador, I'm sure you know they tried to make a market of those things um, because they tried to sort of sell certificates to the world to keep oil in the ground under, uh, under an area that was especially beautiful and valuable and filled with animals and indigenous cultures and, and things like that. So, so it seems all, all, like all of the, the, this kind of fantasy that I'm having about a, about a set of subtraction protocols that each one could be designed for all kinds of reasons with all kinds of mechanics in an interplay of, of, of counterbalancing all kinds of variables and values. I think we would be good at it. Um, better than a lot of people would be good at it. I wonder if you could explain also a bit a bit more about the land banking that you talk about in the book because I thought this was really interesting for as because I, maybe it's maybe it's a bit hard to follow but it, it's it was really interesting to me how you affirm abstraction of the abstraction and networking of value is actually something that can be that can be reclaimed by people to 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 produce a kind of equilibrium or or security or stability when against the volatility of markets. You mean how they actually work or, or yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's that that's the bank, the bank is, there's a thing sitting there and, um, and the taxes are due on it and so on and there's no one there um, and, and it's not behaving like money like it's supposed to be, like it's supposed to. And the banks get very frustrated with it at that point because, and there's no, there's no one, the person that they had gotten on the hook to temporarily sleep and live in this money generating machine is no longer, has long gone. Um, so there's nobody to blame, there's nobody to blame, there's nothing to do. Um, and so then they kind of sheepishly come to the table and uh, they're, they're, um, they're bought out for a lower um, price and or many other kinds of things, tax delinquency deals. In any case, they relinquish the property. And they relinquish the property to a land bank that, that is, and in each of these land banks work in a slightly different way, but, but um, they can then aggregate that property, kind of cleanse it, uh, make sure it's up to code in all kinds of different ways and sell it to vet a number of people that they then sell it to. Um, and so it's either really perfunctory, you know, it's just kind of like, or it's super interesting, um, where, where they are potentially re-aggregating and, and, and creating a different market and all kinds of different values. And, and because they're associated with a number of other um, agencies in cities, one finds that those properties that had been, that had been, the, they had been uh, trafficked mortgage products 
become something else now entirely. They become landscapes, they become things <laughs> valued in certain ways, they get aggregated in different ways. And um, so there's a pleasure in seeing them um, duck out from under an abstraction. I don't know if that's clear, but uh, um, so maybe that's enough. Have some drink. If you say so, if you say so, there's one more. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about the example of Richmond, California, where by eminent domain they are trying to um, get back the the property so that the people in them can actually own them? Um, you, uh, maybe maybe you know more about this than I do, but uh, I mean I I I you know I know what I've read in the newspapers probably like you have not been to Richmond uh, to to talk with anybody there, but. Um, uh, yeah, the, the old eminent domain that used to be used by developers to aggregate properties to make money off of infrastructure and so on, that, that old sort of sneaky uh, and, and, and used often for slum clearance um, uh, is now being used by, by the municipality of Richmond to, to declare, um, uh, uh, to condemn Properties that are that are worth that are underwater that are worth less than their mortgage value, and then the city turns around and gives it back to the to the owner, um, and good for the city because they can then um, start getting taxes back on it. I mean, it's, it's, it comes online again. Um, bad bad for the developers who are crying. You know that um, this is a horrible thing that. In addition to you know, it's like, so it's like their own subsidy, their own kind of welfare subsidy uh, for the developer t turned on them. It's kind of a nice twist. Okay, um, we. You can drink it now. Yeah, I think if you <laughs> so. Thank you so much. <laughs>